the reason this young woman can't find the newly framed poster she's looking for is because this man, Phil Zimmerman, is my hair combed? never brought it here in the first place. Phil is in the wrong store. By the time he realizes it, the young woman has been searching for 10 minutes. So I just didn't know. You know. Okay, I'm not finding it, but... This raises a really interesting question. How can somebody who is so absent-minded be considered a major threat to American security? For everybody, it seems, the U.S. Customs, the National Security Agency, the Justice Department, and the FBI really want to know what Phil Zimmerman has done to life on the Internet. In a network of computers, it's not the MIPS and chips and whatnot that's most important. It's what goes on between the people using them that makes them really powerful. A reminder from Sun Microsystems, proud to support this PBS program. I'm Scott Simon. Here in Washington, D.C., interest is growing in this new territory called cyberspace. Unlike the world it connects, the Internet has no borders, no governmental jurisdictions. How do you enforce laws for people who simply log on and log off? So when software designed to keep email confidential hit the net, it raised important questions about an individual's right to privacy and a government's obligation to protect. The answers to those questions will help shape the quality of life on the Internet. This is a complicated story centered for the most part in Boulder, Colorado. It involves secrets, codes, national security, and the science of cryptography. It also involves what some see as a battle for basic individual privacy against the case for the public good. And at the center of it all is Phil Zimmerman of Boulder. Mr. Zimmerman's cryptography recently won a Chrysler Award for Innovation and Technology, and there was a full-page ad in the New York Times with his name on it. Phil wanted a copy of the ad for his office, so he had it framed. Oh, we went with him to pick it up. Let me get it. Uh, here it is. This time, we got the right store. There are some in the U.S. government who will tell you that Phil Zimmerman is a very dangerous guy, a threat to American national security. Others will tell you that he is a great crusader for American constitutional rights and should be hailed as a cyberspace hero because Phil Zimmerman developed cryptography called Pretty Good Privacy, PGP, which can keep your email secret. Email is notoriously simple to intercept, as easy as cellular telephone calls, so it hasn't been popular with people who want to send confidential messages maybe for lawyer-client communication or medical information or sending credit card numbers across the Internet. But PGP changed all that, and when it appeared on the net for free, it meant that anyone with just a rudimentary knowledge of computer software could download it and make their email instantly unbuggable, which is why Phil Zimmerman was suddenly of great interest to U.S. Customs. Well, when they first called me up, I actually thought they were asking me questions about PGP, and I actually thought that they were asking me they were asking me to explain to them how what pgp is and i thought it was uh, some law enforcement people that needed some help perhaps they encountered pgp in their casework and they needed some expert help in dealing with it and so i quite willingly uh talked to them about it and explained how it worked over the phone and they said they wanted to come to boulder and talk to me about it that's when i began to suspect that there was more in, in their agenda than learning about pgp for law enforcement, Mr. Zimmerman's PGP had serious consequences, for essentially it meant that any group that wanted to communicate could do it without the authorities listening in, even if they had a court order. So suddenly every security agency in the country, and perhaps the world, had a file on Phil Zimmerman. Certainly the FBI's top man in New York, Jim Kallstrom, has one. It's Mr. Kallstrom who's been busy lobbying for the Bureau's position for what they consider the public good. The issue here is do we want criminals, do we want kidnappers, child pornographers, uh, nuclear terrorists, uh, major uh, criminals, uh, narcotic smugglers, 
uh, violent criminals? Do we want them to have unfettered uh, ability to communicate with their co-conspirators outside the auspices of the legal system of a particular country so that a search warrant could not be applied to them? That's the issue. Yeah, I, I'm, I think they have a point. Uh, you know, they're concerned that criminals will use this technology to hide their activities. I think that they can use this to hide their activities. But if you look at uh, the celebrated cases of, of, uh, of criminals that use this, for example, Kevin Mitnick, uh, a hacker that was caught some months ago, used PGP extensively, and yet they were still able to um, arrest him and convict him on everything they wanted to convict him on. The um, use of PGP did not prevent them from gathering the evidence from the rest of the world. Most of these crimes leave their footprints in the real world. So if police just do their work like they always did before, they can find the evidence they need. What's opened up this constitutional dilemma is the technology that Phil Zimmerman has perfected, a piece of cryptographic genius that uses two different keys, or mathematical formulas, to encrypt and then decrypt messages sent over the internet. The first key, called a public key, you could give to anyone who wanted to send you an encrypted message. Then to decrypt that message, you would use the second key, called a private key, to which only you had access. Law enforcement officials fear that in the wrong hands, this could be a serious weapon, but Phil Zimmerman sees it as part of his constitutional rights to privacy. Privacy is a constitutional right, and I would agree with that totally. And I would agree with Zimmerman on most issues. I find him a, a charming, you know, highly intelligent, uh, I think well-meaning individual. Uh, but uh, where I would differ with him is that uh, uh, our common law in this country and our constitution in this country do not uh, place uh, privacy rights with criminals <clears throat> once an independent judiciary has intervened, once law enforcement has brought probable cause to a judge or a magistrate, and that judge or magistrate has said that we have probable cause, criminals no longer have a right to privacy, nor should they have a right to privacy. That's the issue. Zimmerman's exactly right. Citizens should have, but not criminals. This is a very political technology. Um, what happens with government policy and cryptography will influence our uh, civil liberties for the next century. All of our conversations and communications are being moved to electronic channels, to digital channels. And to the extent that happens, it becomes exposed to uh, easier interception uh, by not just governments, but uh, businesses and or um, uh, businesses and governments. Um, but I think most of all, in, in today's uh, tensions between um, our own government and, and our people, um, there's a, a, a fear that outlawing cryptography will erode our civil liberties. PGP is, according to all sources, unbreakable. But to complicate the issue further, Americans using unbreakable cryptography are not breaking or even bending the law inside the United States. After all, what would happen to all those Dick Tracy watches? But what is clearly against the law is to export cryptography from the US without a license. So when the software for PGP appeared on the internet and was being downloaded all over the world, it appeared the government had a case against Phil Zimmerman. His defense, among other legal points, was that he couldn't be held responsible for it because he wasn't the one who put it on the site on the internet. Mr. Zimmerman's lawyer is Boulder attorney Phil Dubois. Within hours of the current version of PGP going up on that site, it was overseas. It was almost instant. I don't believe that it's physically possible to both make something available to American citizens and keep it away from the rest of the world. In the old days, when we're talking about exporting munitions, we're talking about crates of rifles, ammunition, physical things that customs can look for and find and seize, and borders made sense. Borders no longer make sense. We have the internet. The internet recognizes no borders. In fact, it treats them to the extent that people try to put them up as malfunctions and simply routes around them. 
In 1993, a grand jury was called in San Jose, California, to decide whether or not Phil had actually broken the law. The jury's findings were sent on to Washington. In the meantime, both camps have started to dig in, trying to sway public opinion, and the analogies have started to fly. In New York, Jim Kalstrom has a car analogy. If you live in some place and, and there's speed limits on the road, uh, maybe it's the road in front of your house, and maybe you're glad it says 10 miles an hour because your children may run out there to catch a ball. And because the guy down the road with the Porsche 911 could do 180 on that street if he wanted to, we put a limit on him. And he may not like that. He might want to do 180. But for the public good, we put a speed limit on that road. Yeah, this is really no different. In Boulder, Phil Zimmerman also has a car analogy. Um, one could argue that maybe it would be better not to have cars. Perhaps it would, but we are pretty well attached to our cars. And if somebody came along and said, we shouldn't have cars because they help criminals, they would, they would not be taken seriously. Cryptography is like that. It's not something that's, it's not like atomic bombs or, or even like guns. It's not a, a destructive weapon. It's something that has a f positive effects on society. It protects our privacy, our civil liberties. The battle continued to rage, but this is where it gets really confusing. For no one, it appeared, wanted to take the next step. So a theory started going around that the government had done one of two things decided not to proceed with the court case they might lose and therefore create a legal precedent involving the internet, or they had already broken the code and didn't want to publicize that in open court. Obviously, PGP, pretty good privacy, was better than pretty good. It was very, very good. And almost as soon as it arrived on the platform of the internet, it was being downloaded in Europe, in South America, in Asia. Human rights workers all over the world were quickly lining up for PGP, and Mr. Zimmerman believes that it's already saved lives by protecting the identity of witnesses to various international atrocities. It's been used by opposition groups in Burma, by the Mexican rebels, by the exiled government of Tibet, by Chinese dissidents. The main distributor of PGP is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where computer network manager Jeff Schiller now has to make sure the university doesn't break the law. Well, U.S. export control law treats cryptographic software like a munition. It's actually regulated under the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. It's literally like a gun. No more so, it's like a big gun. <laughs> to comply with U.S. laws, MIT has placed restrictions on access to PGP. It automatically cuts off any foreign attempt to download it, and people who request it domestically have to promise it's not for export. If we want to export it, the first thing that MIT has to do is register as an international arms dealer. Now, you can imagine that's a little strange thing for a university to want to do, is being an international arms dealer. Now, a friend of mine who works at a commercial company said we should really do it because you get a really cool newsletter. But, uh, but basically, it treats it as a munition, which means to most places, I cannot freely send it that uh, what I would have to do is fill out for each and every person who would want a copy overseas an individualized export license for that individual, which, of course, might be denied, depending on what country they happen to live in. So that's, that's the current state of, of U.S. export control law. As soon as the software for PGP was put on the Internet, Phil Zimmerman's life changed. He was, quite suddenly, under investigation for what the authorities considered a very serious offense. I mean, uh, consider the consequences. Um, the federal mandatory sentencing guidelines for this offense is 41 months to 51 months in a federal prison. Judges don't have any latitude to deviate from that. So this is pretty serious. Pretty serious indeed. Phil Zimmerman's lawyer, Phil Dubois, has his own theory about why the government has had such a hard time making up its mind to either prosecute the case or drop it. I think we have a very strong defense. Uh, first of all, we didn't do it. Uh, and second of all, it's not even clear that any crime was committed by anybody here at all. Uh, I don't think the government uh, has a very good shot at winning. Uh, and the trauma to Mr. Zimmerman and his family would be extreme. Perhaps part of the confusion lies in the realization that the law is suddenly finding itself left behind 
by new technology. No question. The law is usually always behind technology. And I think we'll always continue to be behind technology. Uh, the law is typically behind uh, not only technology, but a lot of things that take place in life. But uh, technology is moving so rapidly today. It's changing before our eyes. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, when, when technology leaps took place in five-year, ten-year increments, it was easy from a social standpoint to sort these things out. Today, when it's changing that rapidly, it, it puts a lot more compression in the system, uh, has a chance to polarize people a lot more. So it becomes, uh, it seems to, to all sides to be a more difficult issue because of the pacing. Phil Zimmerman is a professional cryptographer, so he knows that part of his trade's code is never to brag, ever to say that his codes cannot be broken. But like the rest of us, he's become more and more curious as to whether the National Security Agency, the NSA, has in fact broken PGP. They won't say whether they can break it or not. Their behavior is consistent with behavior I would expect from those who can't break it, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care to speculate on whether they could or not. I can tell you that I used the very best encryption algorithms in PGP that were available in the academic literature, uh, the ones that had withstood the most peer review. Civilian academia uh, is catching up with, with the NSA, I think, in cryptography. I don't know when we'll have parity with them, um, because we can't, they don't, the NSA doesn't publish their results. But over the past 15 to 20 years, there's been quite an increase in capability in civilian academic cryptography. And I use the best of it in PGP. They don't tell us, obviously, the capability they have. The NSA, the National Security Agency, has an enormous budget, all of which is secret. Uh, so we don't really know. We think, uh, just based on what people know from everywhere, like this is the level of computing uh, resources that are available anywhere in the world, that they probably cannot do it. Uh, but no reputable cryptographer will ever say, oh no, my code is unbreakable. Uh, in fact, anybody who does that is not to be trusted. So. We just don't know. Whether they've broken it or not, Phil Zimmerman won't be looking for work. Since the publicity over PGP, his cryptography consultancy business has been booming. He tells you privately he's now the most famous cryptographer in the world. Not the best, he'll humbly point out, just the most famous. But if things did turn bad and he was looking for a job, the FBI would be interested. I'd hire Phil Zimmerman in a second. <laughs> If he'd, if he'd work for government wages, I would, uh, I'd, I'd offer him a job today. Yeah, I, we could really use his talents. But the FBI might change its mind when they find out what Phil Zimmerman's been up to recently. The latest addition to PGP is going to make everybody really mad at him. The FBI claims that the law has fallen so far behind technology that now police authorities in North America are being seriously restricted in monitoring criminal elements who have access to cryptography. But the big question now is whether or not they can actually stop PGP. The quick answer to that is I don't think you can stop it. And I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Uh, but on the other hand, we're in the information business in, in the FBI and in law enforcement. Unfortunately, it's the information of criminals conspiring, talking to each other, planning the dastardly deed, deciding where to place the bomb. They communicate. So if we're going to allow unfettered encryption to be, be produced in the West, in the United States, <clears throat> and made available, low cost, portable, highly technically competent, on a wide scale basis to people. It will tip the balance negatively uh, for law enforcement. It will take away a very important tool. I think I started thinking of this in political terms about 11 years ago when I was working in the nuclear freeze movement. And uh, there was a need to, um, to to use computers in the nuclear freeze to handle uh, uh, mailing lists, voter registration lists. And we were just beginning to use electronic mail then. There wasn't anywhere near as much as it is today. And I thought that uh, for political opposition groups to be able to use the internet and email, they would have to have encryption. Because our own government has a, a poor track record in respecting the privacy of political opposition groups. They wiretapped Martin Luther King's phone. Nixon had his enemies list. The Watergate break-ins were mostly about wiretapping. As the debate has been progressing, Jim Kallstrom has been lobbying for what he sees as reasonable middle ground. 
Mr. Kallstrom has been seeking legislation which would place all cryptographic codes, including the private keys for PGP, in some sort of escrow within a newly created independent body. Police forces could only get their hands on these codes if they were able to obtain a court order, in much the same way they now deal with cases involving normal electronic surveillance. Exactly. It's actually no different whatsoever. It's just the technology has changed the balance now. Encryption has been around for years and years and years, and we in law enforcement have been protected by the incompetency of the technology. The fact that it was big, it was bulky, it was really the, the purview of governments to have encryption. With the advance of, in computer uh, technology and, and technology in general, integrated circuits, and uh, we all see how, the, how uh, computers change uh, you know, every 18 months is a new generation of microprocessors. It is now available, or could be available, uh, cheap, uh, relatively inexpensive, uh, portable, and highly technically sophisticated to the general public. So that's why the issue is on the radar scope. If you and I decide to go for a walk in the woods and just talk, no one in his right mind believes that we should be forced by the government to carry microphones along to record our conversation so that they can listen to it. Uh, before all this technology came in, every conversation was private. There was no need to make a constitutional uh, amendment to uh, give us the right to a private conversation. There was nothing in the Bill of Rights that, that specifically says that we have a right to a private conversation. That would have been silly 200 years ago. All conversations were private. After his interview with the customs officials, Phil Zimmerman has been living under threat of indictment, waiting for the government to proceed with the charges. It'll be terrifically disruptive, and it has been disruptive up to this point. He has to ask me and some other lawyers just about everything. Uh, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? What if I say this? Where if, you know, can I go over here? Um, he, it's just not a normal way in which to live. They won't tell us. I, they just kind of keep the sword of Democles hanging by that hair, and they won't tell us what they're going to do. But in early 1996, the government did tell them what they were going to do. They decided not to proceed with any charges against Phil Zimmerman. Essentially, they dropped the case. Which is probably just as well, for Phil had been working on taking PGP to the next logical step, which he claims is encryption for phone calls. He's already developed the technology and is now marketing PGP phone, also available from MIT. In fact, right now he's calling Jeff Schiller in Massachusetts on what he claims is an absolutely unbuggable phone line. Can you hear me, Jeff? Okay. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I take it uh, you should be able to hear me. Robert. Okay. Well, um, all right, so now we're talking in an encrypted channel that no one can intercept and is being listened to by millions of TV viewers. Kind of a, uh, an ironic uh, blend of uh, security and publicness. Indeed. Any place between my computer and his computer is an encrypted channel. And since computers are now getting to be ubiquitous, it means that the software, which is freely available from MIT and can be downloaded by anyone at no charge, um, it means that this brings secure communications to the masses. A capability formerly only available to um, um, the government, defense contractors, um, military and diplomatic communications. When we hang up the phone, the keys will be erased and um, and that's the end of that. Unbuggable phone calls, courtesy of Phil Zimmerman. Just what the FBI, the Justice Department, the U.S. Customs, and the National Security Agency wanted to hear from life on the Internet. A good place to begin investigating cryptography is here, the Cryptography and PGP page. You can check out some of the thinking behind cryptography and some background on the issues surrounding Phil Zimmerman. And you can even download your own copy of the PGP software. To get the lowdown on all kinds of computer crime issues, this is the Federal Bureau of Investigation homepage. You can find out why the FBI was started and how they operate, even how to get in touch with your local bureau.
You can look at files on some current FBI investigations. Here's one about the Unabomber. And what would the FBI page be without this? The 10 most wanted list, complete with pictures. Whew. Glad I'm still not on it. Now, after you've heard both sides of the privacy issue, here's a place where you can put in your own opinion. It's a news group where people gather to talk about internet security. You can dig further into this subject by visiting our site, which is not a secret. We have links to everything you've seen. If you have access to the World Wide Web, you'll find us at http colon slash slash www.pbs.org. We hope you'll drop by. Until next time, I'm Scott Simon. In a network of computers, it's not the MIPS and chips and whatnot that's most important. It's what goes on between the people using them that makes them really powerful. A reminder from Sun Microsystems, proud to support this PBS program.